Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number four of the Outwitting with Chico series. I am delighted to be here with you. Um, interestingly enough, I just got off another live call um, as a guest on Beyond the Ordinary, so it's, it's it's a pretty fun, exciting day, and I actually appreciate the challenge of switching gears here, and we will have no trouble at all switching gears because um, Wichiko is already chattering in my ear as I was as I was making my smoothie, um, a late dinner. So let's get started, shall we? Um, I invite you to close your eyes and let's just relax our shoulders and take a couple nice deep breaths here. Whew. Okay. <sighs> hmm. Please imagine within your heart a source of light that is bright and vibrant. And this light is growing within you. And within your field, there are also um, like foggy layers, like uh, mist, that are nothing compared to the light that is you. And yet still present, still noticeable. But easily dissipated and easily maneuvered through. And it's all okay, all these layers of you. All of it fits within the, the divine structure of your higher self. Very nice. Okay, wow, our crown chakras are like completely, <laughs> like, oh, oh man, tingly. Tingly goodness. Okay, um, open your eyes if you haven't already. We're going to get right to it. So since last time we met, um, in episode number three, we talked a lot about um, the afterlife and the stages of transition and the recycling energy and things like that. And what we didn't talk about yet, which Watiko pointed out to me a couple of days ago, is like the conspiracy side of all of of all of all of this. Um, the manipulation and control, not just in the afterlife, but obviously in this reality. So we are going to kind of go there tonight, um, and I'm excited about what what he's got to share here. Okay, so let me just launch in. Okay, so there's many layers of the human system and structures that support humanity that are are very much rigged um, towards separation, towards um, lack, towards... Uh, uh, I don't know what other word to use here, but enslavement, um, keeping humanity so busy that it, it's almost like it, it doesn't have time for the luxury of exploring the existential questions of life. And yet here you are. Uh, you were not, uh, you weren't taken by the uh, the manipulation and the control and the enslavement. Still, you persevered, and here you are today, right? So you should give yourselves a huge pat on the back. And if you realize the level of manipulation and control and way that ways that the system is rigged uh, to keep you so busy that you don't have time to ask these big questions and ponder the bigger uh, the bigger meaning and purpose of of humanity in your life. Um, I mean, you you really deserve a ton of credit. And, of course, one of the reasons why you were able to get to where you are right now is because of your pre-wiring. Um, so please know that, that part of the way that you've been able to, to maneuver through the separation age nonsense is your pre-wiring. I see it all over you. And it never ceases to amaze me how uh, delightful literally the lightful, full of light that you are because it takes light to move through that system um, unscathed. And by my account, you are all completely unscathed um, from, for the most part. <laughs> you may not feel that way all the time. Okay, so um, let's talk about the money system. Um, this is interesting for our partner because, of course, one of her undergraduate uh, majors was in economics. So she was taught the rigged version of public uh, monetary policy and banking 
and all of that. So she's quite curious to see what what I have to divulge on the matter. Currency itself is coded, um, coded with a vibration of unworthiness. There are very, very few people on the planet that can actually look at a dollar bill um, or whatever sort of, of bills or currency you're engaging with or look at a, a screen that has a bank account value and say, oh, I, I so deserve that. Have you noticed that? There's automatically a sense of detachment in a kind of a vibration of, oh, I don't, I don't know if I really deserve you. Uh, I don't know if I really want more of you in terms of money. Um, you kind of make me feel dirty in a way, and I'm judged because I have this, and maybe it's better if I get rid of it. I eat through spending, so it, it compels you to spend in a way. Um, it's, it's, it's coded to be spent, to be feeling, uh, to make you feel like you don't deserve it so that you'll get rid of it. And for some reason, once you've bought something, there's a little bit less of that. Oh, I don't deserve this. There's still a little bit for a lot for a lot of a lot of humanity, but a little bit less so. There's something about the raw potential of just currency, whether it is uh, tangible currency or intangible currency in terms of again dollars on a screen of some sort um, that represent money. Um, the raw potential and freedom associated with large amounts. Uh, that's relative, right? But large amounts of hard, tangible currency or intangible currency is, uh, it's rare. It's, it's, uh, it's unusual that somebody would have, have acquired so much that they feel more and more free. So it's rare that most humans feel free, partly related to money. So money is a very, very powerful tool of the separation age, um, the manipulation, the control, uh, the enslavement, if you will, that, that feels like it's been happening to humanity, and rightly so, in the Dark Age, okay? So no wonder uh, there are some that have chosen to completely detach from the monetary system and do everything that they can to operate outside the confines of money. And yet money itself is not uh, low vibe or negative it's just that it's been coded, C-O-D-E-D, -E with the signals to trigger that sense of spend me, spend me, spend me, and you don't deserve me, so you'll get rid of me. And you may be a little bit cautious about wanting more of me, right? Okay, so for those that have accumulated a lot of wealth, there's a different sort of wiring that tends to go along with that, and that's the sense of... Um, it's almost like what a lot of you call the blue bloods. There's some sort of sense of entitlement that there's something about uh, the bloodline or the family name or the family crest that just entitles you to have extreme amounts of money relative to other people. And it's almost like there's nothing you can do about it. So there's something that keeps those, uh, I was going to say pockets, but it's actually like buckets and truckloads of money for and it keeps it staying in those pockets of deservedness or entitlement. Any of you can recode your situation with money to be in that camp of entitlement, deserving, um, that kind of thing. But you have to get over your guilt program in order to do that. And that, for a lot of people, is a really, really hard one. Um, in fact, our partner just this last week was um, amply triggered uh, by somebody on her Facebook wall. And as there was something, Jill posted something that was just a normal kind of inspirational post like she normally does. And she included the statement, something to the effect of, this is why I love my private session work, because I get to help you see this, this side of yourself, to help you see your mastery. And for some reason, this Facebook friend um, who has since unfriended Jill, curiously enough, um, kind of said, huh, so spirit, and this is how Jill read it, and this is actually how it came, how I'm seeing it too, that she said it, uh, mm, so spiritual, and then it was like dot, 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 I wonder um, why you do what you do, um, how much of it is motivated by money or something like that. And it was just really interesting because Jill was just like, seriously, like she doesn't know all the stuff I give away for free. She doesn't know, you know, that 
I, I mean, if I wanted money, I'd still be in corporate. <laughs> I mean, this is not the source of money for me relative to the other ways that I could earn income. So anyway, Jill was just like, seriously, another person that's going to kind of question me on this. And she hasn't been questioned um, about this many times, but she hates the question because it, there's no satisfying answer to somebody that would ask it. Um, they're, they're, they're in their motivation, their value system, their energy field. If you're going to ask a question like that is already set up as if you're doing this for money, that's bad. Almost unable to see that just because somebody is making money from something doesn't mean that's the only reason they're doing it. It doesn't mean that that's their only motivation. It doesn't mean that they're not doing good for humanity. It doesn't mean that they're not really stretching their neck out in order to provide the services and the work that they do and facing, you know, potential uh, criticism or, um, oh, what's the word, scrutiny from, you know, mainstream society. It would be so much easier for Joe if she were making money from her corporate job. Um, she does get weird sideways glances from people at the school that have Googled her or neighbors, you know what I mean, and people that she interacts with through her husband's professional work. They don't get what she does, and some of them think it's weird, right? Um, so, I mean, there's no, I, I mean, <laughs> it's like that, that person that asks, uh, you know, well, how do, you know, are you just in it for money? They'll, they probably never even think about the kind of risk or downside negative effects of doing work like this. And probably this whole audience faces that to some degree, some sense of just kind of being misunderstood or maybe even ostracized. That's what I was looking for relative to the work that you do right now you probably don't care at some level of you or it doesn't bother you saying you don't you don't care probably isn't fair but um that it doesn't hold you back how about that it, you keep going again there's your strength and that pre-coding of this divinity that's just uh pouring out of you at every step anyway i don't want to digress too much about the the career side but we can if you want to uh in the q a portion i we're happy i'm happy to go there with you Okay, so going back to the, the money and the coding, you can totally recode it. Step one is that everyone deserves the freedom in their humanity, and part of freedom is money, um, or some ability to engage in acquiring what you need to live the life that you want to live, right? So if the life that you want to live is multiple houses and, you know, multi-millions of dollars of, of real estate or, you know, more than one car or whatever, you're going to need, in order to have that option, you're going to need to acquire money. So just like, oh, okay, now, oh, now we're getting into it. Jill's just looking over at me. Oh, my God. Okay, here we go. So just like there are pockets, very small pockets of society that have been some, somehow pre-coded to have lots of money, there are also pockets of humanity, which are obviously much more uh, prevalent, that are pre-coded to not have money. And this is where it gets really, really interesting. It takes a lot of inertia or excuse me, it takes a lot of initiative to overcome a pre-coding of poverty or scarcity. It's possible, but it takes a lot um, because it's not just nurture. It's not just environmental and being passed down from um, one generation to another of, well, you know, we're the have-nots, get used to it, life isn't fair, you know, that kind of thing. Um, or just almost like bad luck related to money. Somebody works really hard, gains a fortune, and then it's gone. And then they gain it back, and then it's gone again. And it's just like one kind of horrible luck sort of situation after another. That is the hallmark of somebody that's pre-coded to not have money. Um, there are also other versions of it where somebody is actually has the hopefulness to, uh, I want to say, recode their relationship with money to to override the poverty consciousness and the lack and scarcity kind of gene. It's almost like a gene. But when given the opportunity, there's other pressures that keep it um, keep it at bay. So let's take the example of somebody that um, they come from very humble uh, beginnings in terms of their their childhood and their family structure, and they don't know anyone that has money. And all of a sudden, they 
um, are making good money, whether it's through sports or they, you know, engineering or, you know, some college kind of pursuit or something that just kind of lands in their lap. Um, they're an amazing inventor. Um, and this big deal comes through and they can sell patents for millions of dollars. Um, they may go forward with that route and then lose it all, uh, you know, blow it at Vegas or something, or they may actually reject the deals that would get that. And they will probably self-sabotage, but if somebody is very conscious, they may actually be able to, to actually verbalize that, well, I don't want that success because then I won't fit in with my family and friends. So it's actually better for me uh, socially and relationship-wise if I don't stand out monetarily because that's going to create more harm than good. Um, so I don't, I don't want that pressure. I, I'm better with the way things are. I'm, I'm fine as I am. Thank you very much. I'll just stay here. So there's a whole bunch of situations, really interesting ones, that keep, keep that poverty or scarcity kind of version there. Um, there are many that break beyond the poverty and scarcity, but they feel blocked from going further into what I'm going to call extreme wealth. And there is a, there is a, uh, a ceiling there, a glass ceiling there. It can be permeated, but it takes a, an extreme sense of entitlement um, to acquire literally that much wealth. Um, and to be streaming into that kind of money. Um, okay, let's relax because Jill's extremely curious about this too. She's like, what? Um, okay, and I'm just going to... So any of you that have questions about this, you you can influence where we're going with this, so feel free to type in a question. Um, I won't take a caller yet, but we'll, we'll take calls in a minute with Star 2. So, Okay, so if somebody's in maybe like a... Uh, lower middle income or upper middle income sort of tax bracket. So they're they're not poor, but they're not, you know, rich, rich either, but they're better than most and, you know, can go on nice vacations or something like that. Um, what's blocking them more than anything is that there's this sense that they have that they can't acquire as much as um, those with extreme amounts of wealth. That it's, there's, okay, here's, the story goes something like, well, that amount of money took generations to acquire, so certainly I couldn't do that. That's one version. Another version is, to acquire that kind of wealth, I would have to sell my soul to the devil. That's one version. Um, another kind of uh, tangent to that one is, People that have that kind of money have had to break laws or make uh, sacrifice their personal values um, in order to get that kind of wealth, and I don't want to do that, so it's not worth it. I would rather not have than have to uh, bend my personal values in some way or sacrifice my what is important to me in order to get that, right? Okay. So those stories keep that person from generating that kind of wealth. Now, what they could do instead is the story could be, yes, you know, uh, let's take the example of like the Rothschilds or the Rockefellers or the Morgans or something like that. Those families didn't always have that money. Um, Joe was watching a documentary on Gloria Vanderbilt and her son, uh, the CNN uh, journalist and reporter, uh, Anderson Cooper, and they went into a bit of the history of the Vanderbilts, and they didn't originally have a lot of money. There was one of the sons at one point after coming to the U.S. that really got into the shipping business and just kicked butt in that so much so, and the timing was right in terms of a, a trade across seas um, that his business just went crazy, and he was in the right place at the right time. Uh, he had the right relationships and the right team, uh, the right talent on his team, and he didn't walk. Aw he didn't shy away from it. He ex he embraced it. He embraced the money that came with the value that he was offering humanity. Okay, that I have to say again. That's really important. He embraced the money associated with the value that he was offering humanity. That is pivotal to a group like this. 
Now, were there some shady dealings and, you know, was he the most, you know, scrupulous guy? It almost doesn't even matter, right? Um, what matters more is that this group, every single one of you, is adding tremendous value to humanity. So the question is, will you accept the monetary compensation that can go along with that, but it's going to take creativity because you're not shipping products across the seas and people aren't banging down your door saying, oh my gosh, I've got to get, you know, this human, you know, human transportation, people across the seas, or I need to get these goods back and forth from, you know, Spain or London or wherever to, to the U.S., and the U.S. economy was doing really well in those days, so there was there was more need for shipments. You guys don't have that, um, so there's not people banging down the door for healing sessions or, uh, you know, consultations or sage counsel, you know, whatever amazingness that you guys are doing in the world right now. There aren't people banging down on your doors to do that, but the question is, could there be? And I would say yes. Once it is clear that you guys are not fringe. You are substance in a sea of nonsense. So whatever you do, there is authenticity, there is love, there is genuine concern that what you are delivering and sharing and creating and offering to the world is going to make a big difference or somebody like you wouldn't be doing it. That's just how you are. So once you can truly accept that and no longer tell yourself these stories of, well, I'm the weird one. I'm the black sheep. I'm the one that the the other moms at the schoolyard or other dads at the schoolyard kind of go, oh, that's the weird one. You know what I mean? She's so weird. You know what I mean? Whatever, whatever you think they're saying about you that keeps you outside of mainstream consciousness and mainstream commerce. I'm begging you to retell your story. What if your new story is, I'm on the leading edge of human potential. And everyone on the planet could do better with what I know. And I'm right here. I've, I've got good stuff for you. Um, good stuff for you as in general for all of humanity or one-on-one, -on -one, however you're deciding to do it, right? And then you start to really change your pattern with how you view your role in the world. And then there's there's still the money part. But anyway, it starts with the value that you know you're adding and the value that others uh, should <laughs> want from you by doing business with you literally of any kind. I don't care if you're selling shoes. They should want to buy shoes from you <laughs> versus somebody else, right? Because those are going to be a darn good pair of shoes, whether you made them or you're selling them and you really want it to fit well and you really want it to help them run faster and not hurt their knee or, you know, whatever the case may be. Okay, there's just so many ways that you guys just, your sparkle goes all the way through, okay? And you deserve to have freedom. That's why we're talking about this, because humanity deserves freedom. Okay, so that's a kind of mainstream case. And then then we encourage you to get creative, basically, in terms of how you do that. Um, be very creative because your ideas matter. And it's almost like the kookier they are, the more you should probably go after them. Because think of the some of the kookiest ideas. I mean, um, I mean, look at some of the <laughs> Look at some of your peer group people, right? Uh, Jill's favorite examples are, you know, Galileo. No, he didn't make millions. That was a that wasn't that wasn't really his goal, though. Um, anyway, Galileo, Van Gogh, um, Steve Jobs, um, Maya Angelou lived a very comfortable life. She uh, was very generous with that, and that was that was her choice. You don't have to be generous with your money, but you can be if you choose to. Um, if you feel like money will make a difference, right? Um, if you don't feel like money is the root of people's problems, then you probably wouldn't be very financially generous, but you'd be generous in other ways. Um, hmm, that was interesting. What it, yeah, sorry, Jill's just comment, just noticing it, that she's interested in what I just said right there. Okay. All right. So now let's look at the extreme case of poverty in terms of outright famine. Um, I mean, not just lack of money, but lack of water, lack of food, 
um, you know, the uh, just horrible drought situations that have happened, particularly in the continent of Africa. Oh, let's just tap into that for a minute. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Okay, this one is getting a little murkier because there's a, there's a coding related to that entire continent that separates it and sets it apart from the rest of the globe in a way that others don't don't face. Europe doesn't face it that way. None of the countries in the Asia in Asia Pacific uh face that kind of um poverty coding. Nobody in the in North America does either. Some pockets of Central America but not so much because it's moisture there. I mean just the the desolation of Africa, even just weather pattern wise, it just it's a it's the perfect storm of just like it's a really, really hard life. Okay. And yet it is known, um and this is this is perhaps the most important part. Every soul at some at some level of themselves prior to incarnating is considering all the options where they're going to be born. Uh, they know the lay of the land in terms of the economics and the sense of um, it's a standard of living. That's all known before they incarnate. So, um, and Jill's talked about this before in other messages, but it's important to include it here from my perspective. It's it's possible to honor everyone's journey, including where they chose to be born, um, the family that they chose to be born into, um, whether that's level of you know extreme lack or a level of extreme abundance. Um, all of that is known by the soul going in. So please keep that in mind and look for honor where you can find it and where you can feel it for another's journey, even if you just simply don't understand it. Um, I don't look at it as the entire continent of Africa is looking to be saved by those of you that chose to be born into these more industrialized, developed nations. Um, it's just a totally different different journey when you when you choose to incarnate into that situation. And it's not to suffer. Um, sometimes it is. To, I mean, literally, there, Jill has seen on social media these pictures of um, like three boys like with very dark skin they look like maybe they're um in like uh where we're gonna pick a country here like ethiopia or something and they're they have no shirts on they've got some tattered kind of like jeans rolled up and bare feet and you see them from the from their backs and they're they maybe look in ages from like seven to eleven years old and you know they're very good friends one has like his arm around the other and they're watching the sunset and one's like holding a stick and they're they're happy, they're smiling, they're looking at the sunset, they're like, Oh, I wish I wish we could do something to help those that are stuck to their computer screens uh feel the joy and the freedom that we feel right now. Right? So it's all perspective and I find it ironic that a lot of the guilt and shame associated with uh keeping money uh, moving and out of and out of your pockets is the same sort of shame and guilt that makes many that have some conveniences of life feel guilty and shameful where they want to um, offer that same sort of comfort to others that at a soul level they decided they didn't need it I mean obviously or they wouldn't have incarnated there so I know this is very very um, I want to use the word advanced in terms of looking and honoring at on honoring humanity but um then i know this is a stretch for uh, for a lot of 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 you even perhaps but look at it another way if you take that example of somebody that is uh in very extreme situations you know being fed from um you know, a relief agency because there's no store. I mean, there's no water. I mean, everything is like uh, flown in because situations are so dire, whether that's war or just kind of a uh, natural disaster, natural situation of a drought or something like that. Um, their higher selves aren't like, oh, no, we need to fix this. 
right? So then why, and in every case where you can grasp the concept that their higher selves aren't freaking out about the situation, then why, why, would, why would you be if you are? Why? Because you care, yes. Because you love them, yes. Because you want to help, yes. So there's, there's just another way of looking at the situation. And the fact is that by looking at the situation from that broader perspective, it will actually free you up to truly enjoy and appreciate the life that you created for yourself. Because you, did, you, it's not necessary that you feel guilt and shame for what you have and what others don't. That's part of the coding. That's part of the separation of age programming is that those that don't have it, most of them that don't have it don't know what they don't have. So they're not crying at night thinking, I wish I had an air conditioner. They don't know what an air conditioner is. And ignorance is bliss in that case, right? So I'm not saying they're not hot and that there isn't death by heat exhaustion and things like that. That is very true. And yet at some level, their higher self knew that. I know this sounds callous and cold and heartless, and yet human comfort isn't a purpose for incarnating. Humanity is, is rife with discomfort of varying degrees and varying types. So some of you have decided that somebody else's discomfort is worse than your discomfort, but it's all discomfort of the various shapes and forms. Okay? Okay, that was a big one. And let us know if you have questions about that. That's a very intense topic right there. Okay, so for those of you that love to help other people, go for it. I mean, if you love doing it, great. Um, what I've been sharing with Jill more recently, and she's become quite aware of this, is is the help making a difference? And is it moving the needle in the way that 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 someone had intended? She's become very outcome-oriented in terms of aid and assistance and charity and things like that. And to tell you the truth, she's just over donating money to disease-based causes. Um, when she, when we, she and I and, uh, and the rest of our team have looked at the energetic structure of like breast cancer um, or any kind of cancer to be, for that matter or any health-related disease, money isn't the problem. Um, there, the problem is much different than money going into a laboratory or research to fix something. It's it's different than that. Um, it's different than that. So no amount of money will fix it. But again, if you have enough money, extra money to go around, you love the idea that money will fix everything. So let's just throw money at it. Um, but money isn't the answer to most things that money is thrown at. And that's sad, but, uh, and it seems uh, callous and heartless to some, but that doesn't change the reality of, of the matter, that money isn't going to fix most of the problems that are looking for more money to fix it. So, um, yeah, it doesn't change the reality of that. Of that. That's just the way it is right now. <clears throat> okay. All right, so let's see. We talked about money, manipulation, and control. Uh, there's other facets of this related to health. Um, there definitely is uh, the game is rigged uh, regarding physical health, uh, biological health. Um, there is awareness that humanity can live longer um, than it is right now. Um, there's like this preset kind of limit of how long you can live, and that's based on a lot of factors. Again, this is very parallel to what we just talked about with money. There's this preset idea of how long you can live. And um, there, are, there is more research, and this research is warranted, that goes into people that have healed from cancer. Not, you know, I, I can't remember the name of the woman. I'll find it. Um, here, I'm going to go look for it right now um, because I want it. Okay. So, okay. No, nope, that's not it. Okay. Uh, okay, there it is. Okay. There's a woman um, named Kelly Turner 
that did research. Uh, she was an oncology researcher, and she started to notice that in the data there were these outliers in the cancer uh, results of people that had cured, been cured. And rather than the research looking at those, the people that uh, had recovery, it kept focusing on the people that didn't have recovery. So she went rogue in her research and she started to do, I think, more independent research exploring what was it that those people that cured themselves of cancer, what did they do? And she started doing research in that. That's worthwhile research, <laughs> was getting the results. Um, and anyway, for some reason, most research, research is uh, like in a downward spiral. Not because of, you know, bad people, just misguided uh, misinformation. Okay, so, and blocked truths, by the way, about what really what really works. Nobody is going to fund research on vitamin C or vitamin D3 or magnesium uh, because the return on investment isn't there. But the results are uh, palpable. <laughs> How much better the whole world would be with vitamin C, vitamin D3, or sun exposure. If you didn't, if you, if you had enough sun exposure, you wouldn't need the vitamin D3 um, and magnesium. The whole world would change, literally, with just those three things. Um, it's amazing. So anyway, it's just interesting. Okay, so the cancer researcher, uh, where else were we going to go with that? Uh, oh, age. Okay, and longevity and mortality. Okay. So um, research on centen centenarians, those that have lived over 100, um, it's fascinating when, when you hear of somebody that's lived to be over 100 and they've had like a beer every day or something like that. There's something about them uh, genetically and the way they look at the world. They tend to be more optimistic, more hopeful, and feel um, a lot of them have a sense of community, uh, purpose somehow that they feel in their life. Um, those, those truths are golden related to uh, feeling purpose in your life. But look at what humanity does, not just in terms of um, as we get older, feeling like we are replaceable, not valuable, not worthy, similar to how we felt when we were children, right? So there's, there's a whole system in place of kind of pushing the older ones out. So their sense of purpose starts to diminish, their sense of communities can start to diminish, and there's just not a lot going on there um, from society's perspective in general in terms of how they look at that that part of the that part of humanity that age range so um, what we would say to each of you as you get older is don't ask humanity to validate you at your age validate yourself make yourself relevant to yourself um, if no one else right and that's that changes the entire game of uh, how long you may want to live, let alone how long you will live, because at a cellular level, feeling hopeful and purposeful and a value uh, affects you at a at a at atomic subatomic level. Okay. All right. So yes, you have the ability to live longer. Um, there is a, a prescripted kind of age range in there, and things would get out of balance in humanity if if too many of you figured out the secret codes. Um, notice that a lot of people are talking about living longer, but they're not talking about quality of life. Um, well, some are, but anyway, hooked to a machine um, or in a degenerative sort of state, that's, uh, that's questionable in terms of whether you call that a life. Um, life, by my definition, is, is alive and awake and conscious and creating, uh, feeling uh, conscious of your creator energy in this world. And actually, by that standards, there's very few alive. There's more walking dead. Um, sorry to be so harsh, and yet not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Um, that was harsh, but that's so true. Most, and that's why Jill laughs, you know, says this facetiously, but she partly means it. In terms of the um, walking dead kind of zombie apocalypse scenario that she sees so often. By those that are literally just animating these separation age programs of lack and disconnection and um, insecurity or, you know, uh, arrogance or whatever that's just totally disconnected with somebody's true higher self core structure. Um, again, the higher structure is still there. It's just that in their consciousness, they're too, they're too disconnected from it to be fueled by it. So what they're animated by is a limited force of energy that's only capable of lasting so long in this reality. Okay? 
All right. That was big. Wow. Like we covered a lot. Okay. So money, health. Okay. Let our partner here get some tea. Hang on. Okay, so we're going to shift gears here a little bit. And that is to talk about the who. The who is keeping the system in place. More than anything, it's all of humanity and the, the, the unwitting participation in these games. Um, far too often in our view, there is this uh, desire to find like an enemy or it's them, that kind of thing. And um, I mean, Jill, <laughs> Jill listens to this program called Red Ice Radio, which used to be more into the esoteric and ufology and, um, you know, divine realms and, you know, off planet energies and that kind of thing. And, and uh, anyway, and that's how she first heard about the Watiko, by the way, because Paul Levy, whom she first heard use the word Watiko, was as a guest on that show. And then at some point along the way, the the creators of the show, um, Henrik and his wife, um, Lana, decided, and I, I, anyway, they decided that it's all, it's all this, Jewish conspiracy that the, the the whole faith of Judaism is is out to like kill the white people and white genocide and um it's very unfortunate because yes there are forces at at play here regarding oh this gets this is getting really uncomfortable for Joel to talk about there actually are forces at play that are trying to neutralize humanity into this uh generic soup where no one actually has a heritage. So for now, it is it is the Caucasian race that has been uh, neutralized, or we, I want to use the word neutered. Um, uh, Caucasians in general, it is, uh, you guys are, for those of you that are Caucasian, that race right now is like on the chopping block in terms of you are led to believe that you're not naturally spiritual, that you have no roots, um, everybody else has deep roots and ancestral heritage that's worth preserving and it's good and it's, um, you know, uh, valuable and rich in, in tradition. But you guys don't. You guys just made up Santa Claus and you got nothing. Uh, so, and anyway, it's just you're all, cons- you know, materialistic and consumer based and you've dominated the world forever and you're just, you know, it's time for you guys to be done and you should feel ashamed for what you've done. Um, the Caucasians were, you know, right at, were, you know, at the, at the root of World War II um, and the Holocaust. You were at the root of slavery. Um, you've done everything wrong and, you know, you're going to pay, <laughs> right? So, and there's actually, there actually are public statements made by individuals, Joe will try to find the reference if you want it, but there was somebody in Kentucky, an African-American president of an, a more African-American than not um, uh, a student population that was in a debate with somebody that they brought in who does represent a white genocide sort of agenda. And the African-American uh, president of the university said there will be no white people in 100 years and the audience cheered that is going on you guys you need to know that now does that mean that there's some other group that's like trying to take the caucasians down not necessarily it's much more subtle than that um there is a a benefit to unconsciousness so I guess you'd say me but not me me because I'm trying to help you guys but the separation age is threatened by anyone that feels like they have value and purpose okay so with all the other uh, race races in terms of not I mean I like to look at things obviously Joel does too in terms of the human race but there are these dividing lines based on how much pigmentation in your in your skin and, and heritage and bloodlines and all those other things but 
everybody else already has kind of like um, something they're trying to get over, whether it's slavery or the Holocaust or um, famine or poverty or whatever. Almost everybody, I guess not so much. Anyway, almost everybody has something that they're like, oh, that was so heavy what we're going through. It's, that's not offered to the Caucasians. The Caucasians are supposedly the, the, the problem with everything. Um, so it's just it's interesting how they are literally being suppressed. Um, and, uh, you know, made to feel almost ashamed of their heritage. Um, that's not okay. And there is a, a, a flavor of genocide, if you will, if you look at the statement like was mentioned by that, by that president. What I, what, what I see as the greatest opportunity for all of humanity is for every single one of you to be extremely proud and extremely delightful uh, delighted at the choice that you made in the race that you picked as a soul, that there's automatically purpose and value in all life, um, no matter what your ancestors did or didn't do. And that personal accountability trumps um, even um, even ancestral, um, I want to I want to say shame or something that somebody did wrong. Personal responsibility, personal values, the individual values and testament of their life should trump everything that that somebody's great great or or even just grandfather did right why is that okay that this kind of trickle down effect of of supposed sin keeps being like laden and burdened onto the 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 trickle down ancestors that's that's not okay and it's not done to all races but it is definitely done to the caucasians um that's messed up and what's sad is that there's so much political pressure that um, somebody of a Caucasian race can't even stand up and say anything about it without being called, called horrible names, uh, racist. Um, oh, there's just a whole litany of, of, you know, insensitive, politically incorrect, but racist is probably a big one. Um, oh, what's the word uh, that would be anti Oh, anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, um, anti-Semite. That's like, what? You know, no one wants to be called that right now for good reason. Um, it is an ugly word, right? So um, is it possible that a group like this could truly be confident at reevaluating if you have had your own version of shame um, and wishing that, um, okay, A, wishing you were of another race because you feel like it would be cooler or more socially acceptable, or, or be closer to God. That's the harder part, is when some of you actually feel like to be um, a Native tribe. So in, in the U.S., they're called Native Americans, but in other, obviously, <laughs> Native, Native peoples from any group, that somehow they're closer to Gaia, closer to spirituality, that they have spiritual roots that you don't. That's actually just not true. They're not closer to Gaia. Gaia is saying amen <laughs> to that. They're not closer to God than you are. But you've been led to believe that that's true. Why? Because you're in the separation age. Okay, so will you have the courage to stand up, be proud of your race, be proud of your heritage, be proud of your ancestry, ancestry be proud of your bloodline, without it being at the expense of another? That's what the controlling forces of political correctness, they're counting on the fact that you won't do it because you're afraid of being called a racist. But the only reason you would be at fear of that is if you actually did believe that your race was superior to another. But we're not talking about that. We're not talking about your race being superior to another. We're just talking about your race having value and meaning and inherent divinity in it just like everybody else's does, right? This, this shame game of self-loathing that for now is on <clears throat> mainly the Caucasians of the world is just weird to see. And the thing is, it's actually weird even to the non-whites. They're kind of like, why are they, why are they putting up with this? I mean, all races have, you know, amazing contributions that they've made to the human race as a collective, so the idea that there wouldn't be more pride, again, not at the expense of another, just overall pride. Why is it okay that the, um, and again, the U.S., the African Americans can be so proud of Martin Luther King Jr. or Harriet Tubman or 
Barack Obama or so many others, yet it would be horrible, apparently, for a Caucasian to be proud of Alexander Graham Bell or Van Gogh or Da Vinci um, or others of, of their same chosen race. But it's not okay. It's not okay to be proud of everyone's race right now. And that's strange. Anyway, so the weird infighting that goes right alongside that of, well, they did this to me on a on a racially based line um, is really, really over exaggerated in many cases and uh, keeps uh, humanity literally from moving forward. There's so much looking for um, someone to blame for somebody's situation and a lot of lack of personal accountability. And yes, there is injustice. And yes, there is um, you know, racially based, um, you know, targeting and profiling and things like that. Um, so there definitely is that. I'm not saying that, but there's a bigger, bigger thing going on here that I'm asking you guys to be aware of. And how you look at yourself, that's the thing. Okay? <clears throat> okay. And we're going to start to transition here into questions. But uh, before we do that, I will add that there is a lot of conspiracy and misinformation related to changing the stories of history to suit this agenda of one race being disenfranchised over at the, at the hands of another and they owe them. There's money involved in this big time. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Jill's horrified that we talked about Red Ice Creations and Red Ice Membership and Red Ice TV again because she hasn't talked about it in years ever since they went into this this uh anti it really it is anti Semitic. It's very it's it's like this notion of this Zionist, you know, uh power play that's taking down the world. And it when Jill looks at it, she's just like, Oh my god, you guys are so you're totally off base on this. Um, like there's some, you know, agenda of Hollywood and that they that they're aware of it and that they're consciously creating this kind of anti white sort of movies and oh god, it's just it, it's so I mean it's, it's anyway. <laughs> okay. So ask any questions that you'd like to and we'll we'll take it from there. Um Megan had asked uh about ten hours ago <laughs> a different question. Um, but I'm going to pause on that one, Megan, because obviously that was before we started sharing tonight. So, uh, Mary Jane is saying, I'm loving this and needing this. Thank you. Oh, Mary Jane, big hugs to you. I'm so glad it was, it's quite uncomfortable for me to share this. So it would be easier for me if I were a non-white person, but as a white person, I felt like I, there's a part of me as Jill that I fall into the trap too of, well, I can't say this. Only a non-white can say that, that it's not terrible to be white. It's <laughs> Anyway, okay. Jane is saying, Jill, what really is going on in depression uh, when it paralyzes someone intelligent, sensitive, and on the edge of knowing his divinity so that he goes a step forward then seizes up? How do I not want to show him another way? Uh, love you with your strength and fearlessness, XXX. Okay, Jane, that's a great question. And I feel like then Megan's question will be more on target, too, because it's kind of going back to previous topics, which is totally fine, by the way. And by the way, for those of you that are live, if you want to share live um, and ask me questions or in share your comments, just press star, too. Okay? Okay, so what really is going on in depression is that the energy field literally is so compressed and actually so hijacked by unconsciousness that this the amount of will to live and sense of hope is like trying to drink the ocean through a straw it's it's hard and if you don't have hope and that sense of connection to literally the life force of source creator god energy that probably most of us take for granted um, unless we know somebody that's been like severely depressed or we ourselves have had some moments of, we've all had some, some degree of, of like, wow, I just feel kind of, kind of not, not as hopeful today. Um, but for some it's, it's a full on depression. Um, so what is going on there is that there's a total imbalance 
related to unconsciousness relative to consciousness that that actually has become a like a snowballing effect and starts to totally take over where it does become sort of like an addiction um you can now this is okay so that's the big picture you can look at it by multiple pillars underneath that you can look at it chemically which is accurate that doesn't mean pharmaceutical by the way chemical imbalance of just uh, neurochemistry that can be addressed by nutrition, um, sunshine, uh, uh, nature. So there's multiple ways to go about that kind of neurochemical imbalance that doesn't have to be pharmaceutical at all. Okay, that's the first kind of pillar is the neurochemistry. The second pillar is entity-based, which is, um, you know, like an exorcism sort of thing related to the Catholic Church where there is an identification of a kind of a foreign quote unquote uh force of energy that is non non it's it is non na it's non native so it's not part of their soulfulness it's not considered of light and bright god essence it's something else that wants to uh take over and take it down and anything else in its path that it can so that would be, <laughs> that would be me with eco right um but I'm not doing it. Uh, this uh, this gets weird. This is hard for Jill to tap into this vibration because it's so opposite of, of the level of me that she's engaging with. So we'll kind of point you back towards um, session one, session two, and session three, or episode one, two, and three of the series um, related to kind of when I have permission, I'll go for it because I have that uh, I have that opportunity slash authority in this reality. So if given the opportunity, I'll take the whole show over. Of, of any form of life that will let me, right? And which tends to be human. Nature doesn't get that out of balance. It doesn't give up its sovereignty so easily. It has no has no interest in it. Um, humans do, sometimes, um, on an unconscious level. So, so that's what's really going on there. Um, it's a it is a takeover, and the takeover is allowed based on other factors of. Um, nutritional, biological, um, energetic, just overall vibrational kind of range. Um, interest in like darkness and that sort of thing makes one, well, it doesn't make one more susceptible to depression and addiction. It actually is the result of. Um, so in other words, most people would probably say that someone that is interested in darkness in this world, that that leads to addictive and self-destructive tendencies but actually it's the other way around that somebody that may for whatever reason have a natural curiosity about extreme separation in the in the in the uh, facets or formats of addiction or self-destruction of any kind is more likely to be curious about darkness so horror movies um harming others harming self that kind of thing it's kind of a chicken and an egg in a way, once you get into that that power, but oh, Jane, uh, big hugs to you though, because it is that is perhaps one of the it's it's perhaps one of the worst things to see is to witness a loved one <clears throat> being taken over by this, and you feel so helpless. And I'm sorry, in many ways, you are helpless, as you know that there's only so much that you can do, and you, there's so much more you wish you could do. And I'm so so sorry. Um, I guess my question to you would be, could you, could you find in your heart and in your brain the space for seeing their sovereignty, even if they're not demonstrating it? Um, the space for looking at things perhaps more from the realm of their higher self and your higher self, that their higher self is not freaked out by this. And that doesn't mean they don't care. And it doesn't mean that they don't love them. It just means that there's a high degree of honor for the way that free will can be utilized, even when it comes to self mutilation and self destruction in this world, and I know that's a asking a lot from the human consciousness to to grasp that, and yet I see you at your mastery, and I would not begin to not offer you that perspective <clears throat> because it is available, okay. All right, so star two to raise your hand. Um, I'm going to go to Megan's question up from 10 hours ago. It's a good question. 
They're all good questions. Okay, so Megan is saying, hi, Jill, can you help explain the difference between meditative astral travel, dream travel, and near-death experiences? For me, I, okay, hang on, I need to drink some of my smoothie here. By the way, I'll just add that I made a smoothie right before <laughs> coming on, and I forgot to add the banana. OMG, it is not good. There's no sweetness. The blueberries and the cranberries just cannot replace the whew, the sweetness. So it's almost tart. Oh my gosh, it tastes weird. Okay, hang on. On the other hand, it's super healthy for me and I'm going to drink it all. Okay, so Megan, okay. Um, hi, Jill. Can you explain the difference between meditative astral travel, dream travel, and near-death experiences? For me, I've never been interested in astral traveling. I don't feel I travel, quote-unquote, while dreaming, though many talk about visiting people while dreaming or being visited by others while dreaming. Could you comment on how these things are different from getting into a deep state of meditation? which I have a hard time doing now and doing and now find hesitation in pursuing as I, as I don't want to astral travel. How would I prevent that? That might become clear when you explain the other aspects of the question. Thank you. Love you. Big hugs. Uh, XOX. Okay, great question. I'm going to tackle the end of it first because I think it would actually, it may be more purposeful than the very good earlier part of the question, but uh, it I don't know how relevant the first part of the question is, given to what you really want to know here. The way to prevent astral travel, if you don't want to, is to is to realize the benefit of staying in your body, um, and that to me is what is what I personally, as Jill, don't like. Um, but she goes nodding with me. Okay, good. <clears throat> oh, let's let. Uh, yeah, we're doing this series so we can hear from him. Thank you. That's fair. So I'm going to step back. Okay. So the reason. Okay, I'm just going to let Watiko talk here. Um, the reason I like astral travel as a as a fan of unconsciousness and, and separation in this reality is that astral travel gives me a huge opportunity. Because when most people are astral astrally traveling, they have left their body. Their consciousness didn't, didn't expand all the way around. Okay, there's... There's two ways to travel in your consciousness. Number one is that your home base is in your bodysuit, right in your heart, and that your consciousness field, which, as we've talked about before, is a ball, gets so big that you can travel within a huge ball anywhere you want to go. That's, if you will, the preferred way of doing it from Jill's perspective and from my and from my perspective as a as a proponent of your human evolution and and further restoring divine origins within humanity that's the right way to do it quote unquote the wrong way to do it which i have been taking advantage of for for many many <laughs> many many generations of humanity thousands actually of generations of of life on earth um of human form is that most people don't look at their human energy field as a sphere, a ball, and they don't look at it as big enough to to be suitable for act, for journeys of consciousness. So their perception is that they need to have like a kite on a string. That, yeah, there's a thin, thin thread connected to their human body, but they want to be the kite. They don't want to be the human on the, on the ground because that's boring. They want to be the kite. So they connect themselves through a cord of some sort, and they, for the most part, are trying desperately to get out of their humanness somewhere up there from their perception to some place that feels freer, um, cooler, um, more out there, kind of a head trip kind of thing, almost like a like a psychedelic experience. And they feel like the body is a barrier to doing that. So they're trying to get out of the body, away from the body, into freedom, their senses out there. But there are serious negative consequences to that. Because if you're not occupying your body, and if you are not 
valuing your body as part of your consciousness and that it isn't a limiter, then those are all the tenants I need to totally mess with you. So I have ample access in multiple ways to totally screw with that person if I want to. Um, some people are funner to mess with than others, though. So, yeah, some people just aren't that interesting uh, to me. So, anyway, some people I leave alone, some people I don't. And I just have access to, and that's how I've been wired at that vibration of me. So, yeah. Okay, so that's how you avoid it, and that's the concern of it. Meditative, and, and uh, yeah, we did it. Okay, so meditative astral travel can be the version. That, see, astral, for most people, when they talk about it, they're talking about that cord, that thin thread, kite, string, human disconnection experience, right? That's what most people think of when they think of astral. Um, you can expand your energy field to include the astral and still have it be centered in your humanness. I, I can tell you no one else on the planet knows this like Jill. No one. No one else can get it for some reason the way that she does. When we showed it to her, gosh, it was probably four years ago, and she was just like, oh my God, that makes perfect sense. You got to take care of your body. Your home is your body is your home base. You got to stay in home base and expand from there. And there's yeah. Anyway, so you heard it here, folks. Um, discern for yourselves what feels right. Okay. Okay. Dream travel can also be of both varieties. Near death experiences are very very different. Okay. So let's go here. Jill's got to totally give it up uh, to me on this one because she doesn't know this. <sighs> uh, it was just, as he just showed that to me, I was like, yes, I do. I do know that. Okay. So a near-death experience, most of the time, oh, wow, she's cautious about this because she doesn't, in a way, she doesn't want it to be true. Okay. So let me let her talk for a minute. I, I want to believe that the people that have had near-death experiences truly went all the way to heaven and then came back. And I do believe that happens most of the time. Which he goes, or he's, not a, he's shaking his head no at the most of the time. That does happen some of the time. <clears throat> okay. But there are other instances. Okay, wait, hang on. I just want to, yeah, okay, hang on. Okay, so with every example I know of, of people that have had a near-death experience and came back to the planet having amazing and very inspiring stories of what it's like in heaven, <clears throat> they did go all the way to their source energy and they chose to come back. Okay, so, um, you know, we all know. <laughs> Several people probably off the top of our hands of, of amazing, really cool stories. I know some of them personally. And it's just, it's so cool. And it does kind of help keep the help keep the, the flow of, of hope and divinity and like, yeah, this is real. This is real. What we're doing here is real. And what's happening in the other ways of us as our higher selves is also real. But there are some instances where someone would say they had a near-death experience that does fit the criteria for a near-death experience that isn't a near-death experience. And those they're minor. So I'm going to try to not get too hung up on the numbers, and I'm going to encourage us to not get too hung up on the numbers and trying to find out fakes from not fakes. It's not like that. Okay, they did have some sort of experience, and it can be valuable no matter what it is. But remember what we talked about in episode number three, that there are individuals that get to certain gates, and then they're sent back in. But most of them in that situation, they actually die, and then they have to come back in as a baby again, or walk-ins, which is a totally different situation, and I think it's highly, you know, way too much press because it's so unusual for a walk-in. Okay, and it's not any cooler <laughs> than what we're doing here, and that's the part that, that bugs me as Jill is that, ooh, a walk-in, like somehow that's better than those of us that came and did the whole effing thing. Please, seriously, right? That's the easy way <laughs> is what I want to say in a way. Okay, but it's unusual and we like what's unusual. So anyway, so a near-death experience, there's multiple flavors of it. it. It kind of in a way doesn't matter. 
um, about whether it was kind of like a redirect where they didn't get all the way home or whether it's a home, a home connection brought back into this reality. All of them can serve humanity, just like I don't feel like it's any less worthy for somebody that's been through the recycle bin. They're not, they're not less valuable than, than somebody that came straight from source. So I'm going to not be judgy about that. Watiko just said, good job, because I was tempted. I'm going to say that I was tempted. And that's why I was hesitant, because I was, I felt an elitist kind of uh, superiority, not me, not me, me, because I'm not, I didn't have an NDE, but um, like, oh, well, it's better to have it be this way. And he's like, no, it's, it's all, it's all valuable, Jill. Um, and I get that now. Okay. All right. So Megan, I hope that answered your question. And I'm not sure if you're on live tonight, but Anyway, I feel like we might be kind of wrapping up. Oh, I see Paul's hand. Paul. Hi, Jill. Hi. How are you? I'm doing fine. Just, Good. I just had a um, quick question. I know we're getting on in time. But um, I was curious about when you were getting into the sort of like the who aspect of, um, you know, uh, looking at, certain attitudes and prejudices that people have, the stories they tell themselves about history and, you know, uh, the role of their ancestors in history and, you know, uh, certain things like the Holocaust or what happened to Native Americans or, you know, there's a lot of stories that we tell ourselves and, you know, and when we look at it in certain respects, it's, sort of like the sins of the past, whether if you were the oppressor or the oppressed. And so I was thinking about, you know, the other side as well in terms of the, the victimization and and how that the weight of that tends to sort of be carried, you know, uh, within various collective settings. And often what is being sort of called for, just through my experience being involved in some of these issues, is a sense of reconciliation uh, and healing, you know, like where you, for things to come together where there's no guilt, there's no shame, there's no sense mm -hmm. of um, loss, but only gain, you know, uh, just nurtured by that element of love. I, I just want to just mention that because it was yeah. on my mind, and if right. you have anything to add, if that's not, that's... I no, I love it. That's the ideal scenario, right? What has happened, though, is that somehow along with that beautiful intention has become this other subversive intention, which is to make someone pay. That future generations owe the other future generations because something for something that neither one of them had any anything to do with. And what I what what Tico was showing me, and it's, I have to say, I'm so uncomfortable with this as Jill because I am a Caucasian, and I I don't. I mean, I do <laughs> I do feel like my my ancestors have been more on the oppressor side than on the oppressed side. So I kind of feel like, well, I I can't say anything like this because I've been on the end. My ancestors, my bloodline has been on the side of apparently the bad guys in all of these, in all of these situations, right? It's always the white guys, right? And yet what Watika was showing me recently is, but try to put yourself in those shoes. If you were of Jewish faith, Jewish race, Jewish culture, would you look at you and say, your ancestors murdered my ancestors and I don't like you and you owe me? Would you do that? And I was like, I hope not. I hope I wouldn't do that, but I don't know. Would I feel so disenfranchised by the entire Holocaust experience that I would still want their future generations to pay for what they did? Just using that one example of World War II and the Holocaust. Um, it's just, it's a fascinating concept of, how long do we play this out? At what point do we say, okay, how many generations ago was that? And what can we do today to truly give everyone the even playing field that everyone deserves? 
Or have we done that and we haven't taken advantage of it? I don't know the answers. But those are the types of questions that I would be asking. And we've we've tried to do a lot of different things. And again, on an outcome basis, I would say we've failed. I mean, when I look at the U.S. in terms of um, Native American, you know, retribution and, and trying to to pay for the sins of things that we've done before and and then like keeping them or you know, not keeping them in reservations, but this sense of like, well, we'll give you this land. Well, what if they don't want to be there? Um, there's just such there's it, it's not working. What do you think, Paul? No, I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, that I mean, I. I I, you may want to share with people like what what <laughs> what your situation is <laughs> because I think I think it okay. may lend even more credibility to what you're asking in this interesting conversation that you are you and I are having here. <laughs> I, I, I can certainly just give you a brief overview. Yeah, but whatever, of you're comfortable, whatever you're comfortable of sharing of 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 what you've chosen to be in your your human structure as Paul. And you know, but, uh, but I'll give it a shot. Okay. Um, well, I'm a Mi'kmaq chief, uh, meaning I'm a North American uh, Indian here uh, in Canada from the Mi'kmaq tribe, and I'm also a um, a lawyer um, who, you know, has been working in various settings, doing different things. Uh, mo- for the most part, on behalf of the nation and communities associated within the nation. So I often um, think about, because I've only been like chief for about three years, and I'm, every day is an interesting day, and I was telling you all earlier that, you know, I used to be very theoretical, but once you're in the position, you've got to be highly practical, and, you know, and I do see your point, um, Jill, about trying to get out of the mindset of somebody to pay, you know. I mean, I, 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 you know, and so what I'm trying to think, and sometimes I can see that, you know, like that sort of rift within community about, it might be within family or certain incidents and whatever that happened where they figure maybe a member of their family has to pay. And so th- th- there's this need for uh, a reconciliation sort of um I, I sort of have this vision in my mind of how it flows typically, but it, it almost seems that you have to get through that healing process. You have to be in that of that mind to have that will and willingness to step forward and engage in the healing process. And part of that, I believe, is having a certain sense of forgiveness. First, forgiving your Like, I don't even know if you have to forgive yourself, but <laughs> maybe you could help me in this regard. No, it's a great question because I, um, I mean, given my heritage, I, I, I was automatically like, wow, I, I feel bad. Um, you watch like Dances with Wolves, right? And I'm like, I feel so terrible for what we've done. And then you look at World War II and like, I feel horrible for what we've done. And then, so there is this kind of, there is this sense of like we, like I was a part of that, but I really wasn't a part of that. And at a soul level, I mean, I don't know, it just, it gets so weird. So I don't know how much I can help you. But I do believe, and I think we talked about this Maybe we talked about this in the the weekly podcast today. I've done a lot of talking today. (laughs) But whomever kind of uh, wins uh, a war or something like that, they get to tell the story. They're the ones that get to write the history books. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. I would say more about World War II than about the the, the native peoples versus the, the conquerors slash explorers, right? That that came over and things like that. But there's a there's a lot that we don't know. There's a lot that we have wrong. Um, so then it gets interesting because it's what Tico is saying. Actually, no one's no one's squeaky clean in any of this. He's saying he's saying that's the irony is that everyone has something ancestrally to be kind of ashamed of. 
that we wouldn't be proud of. And everybody has something that we should be very proud of. So this idea that one group owes another owes something to another group or is owed something by another group, he's saying, I don't know how you guys get out of this, but but it's a big one. And it's it's fueled by propaganda all the time. Because because of this victim mentality that it actually it pays to be a victim. It really does. In sympathy, in monetary, um, we've created a system that it's actually better off for many people. And I know this, God, this is so unpopular. It's really hard for me to say this. Ugh. It's almost like it's better to have, it's like the more crap that's been done to you or the more adversity you faced, that somehow the better you are. Um, it's weird. Mm-hmm. That that that's interesting. I mean, like, um, because you know, through the, the dynamics of um, what takes place on a day-to-day basis, you, you get to see um, certain concepts of entitlement sort of factor out. But also, you know, within those very situations, given the existing history and circumstances, yeah. You, you do see some tremendous um, stories that are being told yeah. by, you know, some very pretty incredible people. So yes. I, I was, like, trying to look at that from a sort of a way where we can sort of move towards, you know, a future that, you know, we just start dropping the weight of yeah. the and thinking more, thinking less about entitlement. And right. Entitlement is important, for example, for legal reasons. There's actually legal mm. rights associated with, right. you know, history and agreements like treaties and things yes. like that. Yeah. So, like, but there's a way to be proud and to be forthright in what is, what one considers, considers to be socially just, right? But not at the expense of, um, you know, playing a victimization role, or, you know, just, you know, saying, well, somebody has to, you know, pay or somebody. Yes. Else. So what? What? Okay, I'm, I'm just going to let Watiko step in here. The, one of the things that that would be very that is very powerful that each one of you are doing is is Hardly what you're doing right now. Really questioning, reevaluating, uh, is this really helpful? Is it having the outcome we thought it would? Or is it kind of keeping things in a groove of separation and disempowerment? Um, in many cases, a lot of these, a lot of these retribution um, systems are perpetuating the problem. There, it's like there's no, it's, in many cases, there's no end point. So it denies the sovereignty of each individual to rise up beyond the circumstances of their ancestry, beyond the circumstances of the present-day prejudices that may still be there. The minute you say to another human, that sucks that that happened, but you've got to figure out a way through this, Mm. there's a very different outcome than Oh, who did that to you? Oh, well, I know why they did that to you because they've been they've been trying to put us down for generations. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. The minute you start to you start to ask that. Well, not you, you, but in general, there's the question of, well, who did it? Well, why did they do it? Oh, it must be racially motivated. And you know what? Sometimes it is racially motivated um, because of the way that I operate within some individuals. That there is a racial bias with some people. But in many cases, it has, it's not personal at all. Mm. So making it personal actually serves to perpetuate the separation. So wherever you notice that um, in your own life, and I would ask you guys to consider, what would you be doing if you were somebody that were getting aid or some sort of... Um, literal financial compensation for something that happened to your ancestors from another group that had different ancestors, would you be accepting that money or not? And there's nothing wrong with either answer. But my guess is a lot of you, for example, if you lived in Israel, and Israel gets millions, 
of dollars from Germany every year. As a nation, that's not aid. That's, that's the price that Germany has to pay still for World War II. That's not very public. That's a, it's, a, it's noticeable, a noticeable chunk of their, of their GDP, their gross domestic, gross domestic product. If you were in Israel, would you be at some point say, well, the people that are alive today didn't have anything to do with this. And when is this? When is this milk money going to be shut off anytime soon? Or is it still valid? I don't, I don't want to presuppose that I have the answer as Jill, but these are good questions to ask. When does it end? Yeah. No, no certainly. Like, when, when do you sort of become, like... Sovereign. Independent, free, sovereign. And yeah. one of the things that was coming to my mind when you were mentioning, like... I mean, it's almost like collect individually and collectively, we have to rewrite our stories. And I, I, I was, you know, as it relates to lack and victimization and stuff like that. So I, I was thinking about potentially the role of ceremony or having various ways or recreating certain traditions to allow us to sort of um, just, you know, get out of the, that sort of mentality of having somebody to pay or, or, or mm -hmm. victimization and things like that so we can just, you know, yeah. collectively move forward. I yeah. Guess. But the other thing that, that I would add is would take to you in particular, Paul, or anyone that's involved in the legal and the justice kind of structure of humanity is this insatiable desire that humanity has to hold someone accountable for things that go wrong. And in many cases, it, it's unproductive. Mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't serve in many instances um, and it, it delays the process of true healing of true moving forward um, and I'll, I'll just step in here as Jill there was a really interesting situation that happened with my mom several years ago um, gosh I don't know if I feel comfortable sharing this <clears throat> no her higher self just gave me the thumbs up so I'm going there she was sitting on an airline, and um, above her um, was, I don't know, she calls it like an ice pick or a mallet or something. And the flight attendant or something wasn't secured, so it fell on her head. Um, and I, I can't remember if she needed stitches or something like that, but I mean, yes, my mom was injured by it, but my mom also wasn't great <laughs> physically before that. So I would say it's debatable about how much of that injury actually led to some of the things that she was able to demonstrate to a doctor to get proof. So she got this really impressive lawsuit a settlement from one of the airlines. Um, she was able to get like uh, new teeth. I mean, she, you know, like one of those false teeth that you put in the front uh, veneers or whatever. So her smile is beautiful now. That had nothing to do with the injury. They just had extra money. So they, so they, <laughs> they got my mom a new smile. And she does look beautiful. But I'm just kind of like, well, everybody pays for that. So it was kind of, my husband and I the whole time were just like, oh my God, we would never do that. But she wanted somebody to pay. And there's a system in place that's like, well, they should pay, you know what I mean? And then it just becomes this weird spiral of, of, you know, litigious kind of like making somebody pay. That flight attendant, I mean, yes, could it have been prevented? Yeah, it could have. But nobody meant to cause harm to my mom. So her kind of looking for other ways, I'm, I'm not trying to blame my mom. I mean, it's the system that I'm blaming, but... It's just like, I never would have sued for that. I would have said like, okay, let me figure out what kind of medical bills I actually have. Let me send you the bills and let's be done with it. But mistakes happen. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's a really good example, Jill. I'm glad it was helpful. It was weird to share it. <laughs> It'd be different if it were my, if it were me, but it's my mom. <gasps> I love my mom. <laughs> she has different ideas about things, though, that's for sure. <laughs> uh well, thank you, Jill. This is 